Good morning. Um, so I'm going to talk today about device tree and ACPI um, compatibility. Um, we have these device tree properties. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the use of device tree properties, um, but we use them to describe um, properties of devices um, more than simply saying what the device is. Um, and they actually originate from open firmware um, used on Sun systems and then IBM um, PowerPC hardware um, predominantly. Um, so we saw them on the, the early PowerPC reference platforms that were used for getting um, Windows and other um, operating systems running on a, a common, um, basically a, a PC-based um, design. Um, and then moving to the, the newer common hardware reference platform and then the systems that are used for IBM machines, even, even these days, IBM Power. Um, and it gives us a way to describe properties of the device. The biggest, the, the fundamental property is compatible. It tells you what it is. It is a 16550 UART, for example. Um, and there are other standard device properties that all devices might have in a standard form, such as the interrupts, the registers, addresses, um, and a device type, which we mostly don't use in Linux. It's, it's the class of device, for example, it is a serial port. But we don't really use that because obviously there is a specific compatible property that tells us specifically what serial port it is. And if you have a driver for that that isn't aware that oh, this is a serial port, then it's probably not a very good driver in the first place. Um, so we have the standard device properties, and we also have device-specific properties. So for the UART example, which I'll keep coming back to, we have things like the clock frequency. Um, on a PC, you have the standard serial ports, and they have a clock frequency which is always the same. Otherwise, things just won't work. So the maximum speed you can get from a serial port on a PC is 115200. And if they were to give it a different crystal and make it go faster, then things would break. Because on a PC, typically, there has been no way to simply say, oh, your clock is faster. Now you can do something better. So on the Super I.O. chipsets we've seen in PCs, they've had all kinds of nasty hacks so if you recognize that this is a particular um, type of Super I.O. chip, for example, some of the National Semiconductor chips, you could set some board rate divisors, which were the maximum value possible, which would normally equate to a really tiny board rate. And they actually mean a multiplier. So you could go to faster speeds by using stupid divisors that you'd otherwise not use. And other chips had special ways to tickle them to get faster speeds. All of this pain and the fact that you were always limited to that speed basically came from the fact that on the PC we did not have the way to give device to, to give additional properties, additional details about the device further than it is one of these. Um, so the, uh, the other properties you might see, um, current speed, so if uh, BIOS has been communicating out a port at a given speed. If you're already talking to an embedded device over a serial port, it's quite useful to know which speed it was at so you can continue talking and not at the same speed and not lose communication. So we have a current speed property and the kernel can take over and continue at that speed. <laughs> and other details when you're gluing devices onto a MMIO bus, you might have them, you might have each register four bytes apart because you have to do, it has to be a 32-bit bus. And so there are other details, the register shift um, will allow you to cope with the, the standard registers of the UART being at, at different offsets than they would normally be. Um, so this is the utility of the device-specific properties. This is why it's really important to have that. Um, and this is especially important in embedded hardware. Um, I know Linus likes to rant that everything should be entirely discoverable, like PCI is, and that the hardware should tell you what it is, and you should never need any further information. But that costs money. It means extra transistors on the board to do this discovery of something that's soldered down anyway. It's a software problem, which we should be able to solve in software without making the devices more expensive. Um, 
So we absolutely need to do this for, for built-in peripherals and for things like the, you know, the toys that Greg was showing yesterday, which are completely pluggable. Yes, absolutely. Self-describing hardware is, is really what we want there. But for things which are glued down, we do not want to have, have to add an extra EEPROM to the board with a MAC address because we can't work out how to store it in software. Um, so Linux um, has had a number of ways of dealing with the device tree properties. So on Spark systems, Linux would actually be booted by open, by open boot and open firmware would remain active at runtime. You would be able to make runtime calls into open firmware and so you would be able to query the properties of a device um, while you were running. And so we had completely live access to, to properties on, on Spark. I'm not convinced we still do. Um, on PowerPC, typically, we would query all the properties for all the devices in the tree at boot time, and then we, we, we would tell Open Firmware to die. We would quiesce it. Um, so basically, we would suck out all the properties into, in very, very early boot um, into a piece of memory, and then we would finish booting the kernel, and then we, we would interpret that. We would build up our device tree um, from that information. And that's really the origin of what we have now, which is the flattened device tree. It is, it's grown from that intermediate um, blob that we built up during the kernel's boot time. So typically on embedded systems now, um, ARM systems mostly, um, there is no open firmware. We're not sucking device tree properties from a real open firmware implementation. But still, we have this flattened device tree blob which describes all the devices. And there is a specific binary format for that and a compiler which will take it from a human readable format um, in, into the blob that the kernel will read. So now we have the, the boot loader or the firmware providing this big binary blob of data with all the properties telling us what devices are where in the system and, and how they are interconnected. Um, so here's an example of some device tree source describing another UART. I'm very keen on UARTs. Um, so it starts with the compatible string. It tells us that this is compatible with a 16550. But actually, you can have multiple compatible properties. Yes, it's a 16550 with a larger FIFO, I think, but it's also compatible with a 16450. If you only have a driver that understands that, well, that would work too. So the compatible property is an ordered list of things that this is compatible with. So when you add new features to a device, you can create a new compatible string for that newer device with the new features. But if you design it right, you can also retain the old one so it continues to work with old drivers just without using the new functionality. And so, yeah, these are various examples. I'm not going to go into detail about how the registers um, and interrupt stuff works, but you can see at the bottom the clock frequency. That is 16 by 115200. That's the, the input clock to, to a standard UART. Um, so you can see that in this case they haven't taken the opportunity to say, hey, we can make this go faster and be more useful because um, they're, they're still using the, st the standard clock. So that's how things work in the device tree world. And it gives us the ability to do all kinds of things. And if you look up there, you can see that you know, we can describe exactly which interrupt from which interrupt controller is um, being generated by this device. We can describe how we put together our embedded board without having to add hardware to it to let the kernel discover this for itself. Um, so to compare, in ACPI, the, um, ACPI does a lot of other things other than purely device enumeration, of course. But the device enumeration basically grew out of ISO plug and play, has the same um, type of device ID. So it's four letters, three or four letters, uh, and four numbers. Um, and you have a very similar setup with compatibility IDs. So an ACPI device has a hardware ID, which can be considered equivalent to the 
first string in the compatible list for device tree, and then it has compatibility IDs, which are, again, other things that, that it is compatible with. But the thing in ACPI, until recently, was there was no way to give any more information than that. There was no standard way to give additional properties and describe the device. So that's what's been added in um, ACPI 5.1. We've added a DSD device-specific data method. Um, and so this is ASL source. You can, this is what's used to build into the the ACPI um, description. Um, for reasons which I won't go into because they're painful, um, each, um, each DSD object has a UUID. Um, you can see a, a large UUID there. That, describe, that allows us to be more versatile in what we will offer in this device-specific data. For now, and hopefully for the foreseeable future, there is only one UUID, and it just describes the rest of the data that you will see, which is a set of properties, a name, and then something else, the property. So um, a package in ACPI is, is, is just like a struct, basically. So what you have here, the DSD is a package. Uh, it is a struct containing a UUID, and then a struct of properties. Um, hopefully we won't see too much use of alternate UI, UUIDs. It, this is versatile enough to do fairly much everything we, we want. Um, so we can now convert, sorry. Um, if it lacks parentheses then I think that's possibly just a bug. I believe it is merely a syntactic thing. I, I, please don't query me about the precise syntax of Excel. Um, I don't think there's anything to be inferred from the presence or absence of those. That is just how you describe a, a package. Um, and I have a feeling that. I should have had them everywhere, but I, I wouldn't swear to it. Um, so this allows us to give properties for a device in ACPI. Um, and so now we have device drivers in Linux which can gain the same properties from either device tree or ACPI um, descriptions. Um, and so where we had open firmware specific, even though it was used in platforms without any open firmware at all these days, um, where we had device tree specific methods for obtaining information, and this is again from the UART driver, um, now we should be converting those to use the generic device property um, APIs, and those will work on a device regardless of whether it was discovered via ACPI or device tree. Um, so a few drivers have been manually converted at this point, um, and I'm looking at putting together a Cochinelle script which will attempt to do some more conversion. It needs to be done with a little bit of care rather than just completely automated but it would be very useful to deprecate those old APIs, at least in leaf node device drivers, um, and move everybody to using the generic device properties, certainly putting in a check patch check to say, no, you should not be using those old um, APIs in a new driver unless you really know what you're doing. Um, generally, there's no particular need to use the old open firmware-specific APIs um, so that solves one part of the problem, and you can now have those um, properties on an ACPI discovered device. Um, but for now, you still need to have a new device ID in ACPI. You need to is issue a device ID. Um, at least you only need one in the olden days. For every possible permutation of device with different redshift with different FIFO sizes, etc. you need a completely different hardware ID because that's all we could do. We could say, we can give one hardware ID, one name, 
And so if there was a slight difference in the device that we actually wanted to convey, we'd have to invent new hardware IDs for each one. Um, but at least now you can have a single hardware ID and the, the definition of the properties goes with the hardware ID, much as it does with the compatible string. It's called the binding in um, the open firmware world. Um, okay. Yes? It's described in ACPI 5.1. Um, yeah, I don't see why you can't add DSD objects to um, anything, really. Um, and there's certainly, from the Linux point of view, there is no requirement I don't know what else is added in ACPI 5.1. That is mandatory. I don't know what stops you from simply saying, my board that was ACPI 3.0, now it's 5.1. I don't know if there's anything else in the spec that's mandatory that, for example, an operating system might assume. But certainly from the point of view of DSD, no. If we see a DSD, we do not suddenly assume that this is an ACPI 5.1 system and start doing something else which will crash or fail to work. Um, I do not know the official answer from the spec about whether it's permitted to do that, um, but I would guess it's fine. I, I think that you can add these new features. Basically, the new spec gives you the permission to use these new features and describes how they work, but I don't think that you are required to go and make other massive changes just in order to use one of the new features. That, that wouldn't be sensible, right? So, yeah, I think you can do that quite happily, and certainly in practice you can. Um, so, the remaining part of the problem is matching devices. So this is how you match a device tree device. You provide a table of the devices that you recognize by their compatible string, and you give a module device table so that the device can be auto-loaded, and then in your device driver, which I haven't bothered to include here, you give a reference to the same match table, um, and then when a device three device is discovered with a given compatible string, your probe function will be called and you will you will bind to the device and you can start using the device. Um, and for ACPI, it works similarly, except, of course, the device ID is different. And so you have to have a different device ID for um, the device and you have to modify the driver. So at this point, if you want to use a device that has been working on a device tree platform, and if you want to use ACPI there, um, you still have to hack the driver. Although the properties after this hypothetical Cochinelle script um, should work fine, um, you still have to sort out the matching. But, So the, the code on the two previous slides, yes, that goes in the driver file. Um, that, that's part of the, the boilerplate for, for making a driver. Sorry? Once only one of these. No, you can have both. There are devi device drivers that, that do both. Um, and so, in fact, to take a, an existing device tree driver and make it match against an ACPI device, you would be adding this, ra rather than having to replace it, rather than having to make a new driver. You can do both. But we don't want to. We, we, don't, we want to be able to do this without touching the drivers at all. Um, so we, what we've done is we've invented a new device ID, PRP0001 in ACPI, and that means that the actual device ID shall be found in a property by the name of compatible. So the Linux device matching code will now see that it is a PRP0001, and for Windows will find it difficult to support this, so in some cases you are also going to see, see specific HIDs, as in this example. Um, but Linux doesn't need to be ha patched to recognize specific device IDs for that. For something that already existed with a device tree driver, we can see the PRP0001, and just like the compatible string, we'll match them in priority order. And if we have no device driver for ABCD0001, then we won't match that. We'll fall back to the 
PRP0001. And that will basically register that as a device tree device, as if it were discovered by device tree, and then an existing device tree driver will be able to bind to that directly. So by doing this, we have a way to migrate between device tree and API and back without actually having to touch device drivers. So one of the motivations for this, was, of course, was for people to be able to take an existing de design with an ARM chip in it and to take it out and put an Intel chip inside it. And often when they do that, they use AC EFI and ACPI. And we wanted to make it seamless so that making that change and being able to switch between CPUs and, and firmware um, was possible without having to go and rewrite all your drivers. And so by working on the changes to the ACPI spec and pushing it through and getting the, um, the code into the kernel and inventing this new PRP0001 device, we have made it possible to do that and to seamlessly migrate from one to the other. So there are some interesting pressure points. Um, there are things that ACPI already has a way to describe that would be incompatible with uh, a naive transliteration of exactly the same properties from device tree. So GPIO, for example, um, this is a possibly also quite a badly syntactically written example of how you might represent GPIO. So you have a device, the foo device. It has a GPI that, oh, that can reset it. There's an input pin to that device, which is a reset. And it is connected to some other GPIO controller somewhere on the board. And we need to tell the kernel how that works. And so somewhere there is a description of the GPIO controller. Um, and then in the description of the foo device, there is a reset GPIO property, which basically has a reference to the GPIO controller, an index saying it is the 30th pin, the 30th output of that controller, and it's active low. And so that describes the reset. But um, that isn't compatible with the way that ACPI already has to describe GPIO. And I'm definitely not entirely familiar with you know, exactly how that works in the, the CRS. Um, GPIO, but that's how ACPI already had a specification for how you describe GPIO, the, the GPIO resources used by a given device. And so in order to make that work, we've defined a, um, we've defined the meaning of the GPIO um, properties um, as being something vaguely similar, but different. So it is a reference to the device and usually it's going to be the same device. <coughs> um, and it's an index and it's the first um, GPIO resource in that device. There is only one of these ones, but it's kind of down to make, make a bit on the side. Um, and then there is the pin within that for each resource. Um, HPI GPIO resource can have multiple pins. And then a big saying it's active load. So generic driver code will simply have to make a call to say, get me the GPIO description with this name, um, or this name, this index. And regardless of whether it's done by ACPI or device tree, we have a high level function call, which will just get the information in the right way. So rather than being a naive transliteration from device tree properties to, um, to ACPI property, DSD properties, we actually have high level functions for obtaining the information. So this is one of the reasons why simply converting the drivers needs to, done, needs to be done with a little bit more care, is we actually need to take a look and say, wait a minute, this is, yes, this is reading a, a string and doing something with it. We could convert that to a device property get string function but maybe what we should be doing here is using a high-level helper and actually acting on the data in a different way and representing things differently in ACPI. Because that's been one of the, that's accounted for some of the pressure we've got, certainly from the ACPI side, that wait a minute, you're just importing this whole device tree thing and ignoring the ways that ACPI already has to do things, which 
which is an understandable concern, but, but I think we can, we can cope with that. Um, so that's basically where we are. So you can take a board that now, you can reuse the existing device bindings. It's, that is a mixed blessing. Um, device bindings are quite hard to get right. It is difficult to know how the devices will change in future and what features will need to be added um, and what, how things will need to be described in the device tree so that a driver will be able to cope with future instances of the hardware. Um, it's quite important that the device bindings should describe the hardware. They should never depend on software and what the structure of the driver looks like. Um, and that people often get wrong and they do things which are specific, only really matter. They give information in the driver, in the properties, which only really matters to a specific way of implementing the driver. And that's generally a sign of bad design. Um, it's useful that we can reuse the existing device bindings, therefore, um, but actually in some cases we might not want to. Um, the ACPI spec is now under the umbrella of the UEFI forum, and they are looking at putting together a device binding review um, and a database of device bindings. Um, and so there is a possibility that some of the existing device tree bindings will will end up there too, so that we, we can have a central kind of reviewed database. There's also a distinct possibility that we'll end up being a free-for-all, just like the existing device tree bindings turned out to be after we had a clean new start with those as well. But basically, yeah, we have that. I don't think that problem is ever going to change. We are always going to have people on a schedule trying to ship something today and just this is what we need to describe it, this will do for now, and, and then having problems with a later kernel. We need to really get people out of the um, habit of changing the bindings and the device driver and the hardware all at the same time, because that's absolutely not what any of this was described, designed for. But at this point, after we've finished the migration, we have no need to modify de device drivers. You can just you can have the same hardware with different firmwares, and, and we have plenty of um, ARM and Intel boards which can boot both ACPI and um, device tree firmwares, and, and you can boot the same kernel on both, and the same drivers just work with both without having to hack the drivers. Um, and yeah, as I showed, it, it preserves the native um, information from the native representation of things like GPIO from ACPI where it can. And there are other things that will be added in the um, ACPI spec later. We don't have ways of um, representing precisely how clocks are um, connected up between devices, but we're looking at how to fix that in a suitably high-level way so that, again, we're not just naively translating the existing properties. Um, so I think that's fairly much what I have. Do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, for the transitions to be really seamless, uh, it seems we have to rely on other and both manufacturers to actually uh, implement the same thing in HPI and in the import in UHP. In UHP, where I was more or less under the kernel control. Which is quite yes, but it should never have been. That was never the point. Um, yes. Um, we do. We do have to rely on the firmware to get it right. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we, we have it under the, the kernel control because they didn't get it right. Yeah. The only reason we, are, we have this overlay, we have the facility to provide, to provide the device tree blob as part of the kernel, which is a heinous misdesign, is because the firmware wasn't providing us the right blobs in the first place. And yeah, we can override ACPI. DSTT as well. That's fine. We can we can do the same override. Um, we don't want to. Yes, they should get it right. Um, so, yeah, nothing's changed there. I think is is really the, the response. No one does that. 
So the questions are, I appreciate, I'm sporadically repeating the questions here. So the question is, will we have to do the same thing? Will we have to provide the ACPI table as we have on um, under device tree? In some cases, we will. Um, yes, we absolutely need to be moving to completely open source firmware. So if the firmware isn't providing the right um, information, you can just fix it. Um, but yeah, if your firmware is just not providing the right information, you are going to have to fix that, whether it be device tree or ACPI. Um, we there is some hope that by putting this through the ACPI forum, through the UEFI forum, and getting the bindings reviewed and into some kind of database, it's, it's very informal, certainly at this point, but there is some hope that by getting that done, um, we will improve the chances of board vendors getting it right. And what we really want to see is the bindings, the list of which properties have which meaning, they should live with a data sheet for a device. So a compatible string or a hardware ID, just like a PCI ID, describes a device. And you work out what it is and who made it. There's helpfully a vendor ID in, in PCI. Um, and in, in fact, there usually is in co compatible strings as well, often. Um, but you then go and find the data sheet for the device in question and you look at what all its registers are and how it behaves and what it does and the various ways in which it's been found to be broken. Um, but that data sheet in an ideal world would contain the bindings. And I think in a world where that can work across the board for ACPI and device tree, um, I think that's slightly more likely. It's something we should be pushing for. Um, so in any case where we have influence over manufacturers and can give feedback on their documentation, absolutely we should be doing that. And that in turn will improve the chances of people getting it right because this is how the device works. And the, the properties in this way are a fundamental part of the device description you know, in terms of what goes in the data sheet. And this is useful not just on embedded platforms, um, but it's also useful on, on bigger machines. And this came from PC class machine, power PC machines. It's still used actively on IBM Power, big servers. Um, and th there's nothing fundamental to the embedded world here. Yes, I spoke about um, the fact that you really don't want to have to add an extra EEPROM and increase the, the bomb cost just to work around a software issue. But actually, the, the same thing's relevant. We've got issues with Intel onboard Ethernet. Every time you get a shiny new server board and you try to boot a Linux distribution on it, the network doesn't work because it, we like to make shiny new features in the hardware and we don't keep them compatible. But what if there was a way to do that and to describe in the device properties a way to you know, just the basics of how to drive, drive, this, drive this device and do enough to get your operating system installed and download a new driver. Because, yeah, a lot of people just have a USB Ethernet dongle to plug in so that they can work around the fact that, yeah, we don't have that device description. So I think, and I may be being wildly optimistic here, but I think that there is some hope that that will improve, and we won't have to consistently provide our own. And it is horrible in the Linux <laughs> world that we have to provide our own. We really should not have to do that. But that partly comes down to bad bindings, because you've changed something in the binding, and you have to describe what, the, the, what is given to the kernel and how the kernel interprets it at the same time. And that is because we have not stuck to the rules about this shall describe the hardware and not details about how the software has implemented it. One of the prime examples of those is um, in the sound um, subsystem. Sometimes you know, we have individual drivers for different codecs and we might want to see different device nodes for those, etc. Other people might have a monolithic driver for a board or a, you know, a, a subsystem 
which includes support for all the various codecs which are glued together. And you could make your, you could design what is in the properties and how they are structured into a tree based on how you happen to have written the driver today for this operating system, and that is not a good design. And that's precisely what's led to, oh, let's stick the device tree blob into the kernel so that we can change it when we change the driver. No, if you have to do that, you've broken something. Go back and think again. So we're, if, we are really keen to avoid some of those problems. And that's why we're quite keen to have this review form for bindings and try to get some sanity so that we don't have that problem. We absolutely do not want people in the mindset that they can patch the kernel and just fix things up. Partly because we want to support other operating systems. We want to support Windows. It's, it is non-trivial to do the PRP001 thing in Windows because of the way that device drivers bind. So it's quite likely that to support a device in Windows, you will have to allocate a specific API head. But it can still use exactly the same properties binding that the compatible string does. And you can do exactly what I had in my example back there somewhere where it has a specific head, which Windows binds to, but we don't actually have to bother adding that head to the, Win to the Linux driver because it will just bind via PRP01 and, and compatible string. So we have the sa exactly the same issue. We want, the, we want the bindings to be stable, and once, we, once it hits Windows, that will be particularly important because they can't just go and fix it there. Um, so, yeah. We hope so. Windows doesn't have to use it. If, if the question was literally, will Windows use the DSD, um, then that would be harder because it's hard to change, chase things into the Windows core. But this is something that individual device drivers can do. So yes, we anticipate that device drivers will do this. And eventually, maybe there will be some you know, library type functions provided by Windows itself that device drivers can do instead of having to pass the DSD for themselves. But to start with, it will just be, you know, it's kind of piecemeal. Individual device drivers will be able to do this. That's true. It's not relevant to a lot of Windows device drivers, but actually there are a number, especially on embedded platforms, where it is relevant. So yeah, it's not necessary for everything. This isn't going to be ubiquitous, but there are some cases where we really, really do need to be able to describe a device more completely. Um, and to be able to ship a slightly changed version of hardware without having to requalify and ship new device drivers. It's a pain in the Windows world to get a device driver to the point where it is shipped in the box. And if you can change your hardware without having to replace the device driver, isn't that a useful thing? So yeah, you're quite right that it won't be useful for everything. And for pluggable devices like PCI, USB, yeah, you want those to be self-describing to a large extent, although there is potential for putting some properties into config space or something in a standard way on a PCI device, so that again, you don't have to have an explosion of device drivers and permutations of IDs. You can just, describe, hey, you can just say, for example, I love the UART example, it's nice and simple, you can have the PCI UART device, and it could have a property somewhere in config space that you can read to say how many UARTs there are. This is a four-port card. This is a two-port card. We don't need an explosion of different device IDs, such as we already have in the kernel for God knows how many dozens of serial port cards. So even in the pluggable devices, there is some scope for using these facilities. Um, and actually... Where is Greg? Um, was talking. Hello. You were talking yesterday about, yesterday about using device tree overlay for properties on pluggable devices for exactly the same reason. Let's have a look at whether it actually has to be literally device tree blob overlay 
let's make sure it can fit in and work with the device properties however they were obtained in the first place, if we can. I don't know. But let's make sure you do. If you don't have that choice, then we have not yet finished making the changes that we need in the core to allow things to be hot plugged. Really, if you want to be able to support ACPI-based processor modules, then let's look at how those properties can be added at runtime. And yeah, I, you're right, I don't think we have it for ACPI yet. Um, maybe it shouldn't be specific to ACPI or device tree in the first place. Maybe we should have a way to add it at the generic device properties level. But let's look at that. There are ways to do pluggable tables in the SSDT. And we, it, it can be done, yes. But the mechanism for that doesn't have to be ACPI. In talking about Greg's use case, those tables don't have to come in as device tree tables or device or ACPI tables anyway, as long as they get into the generic device property system, right? Yeah, and we could solve that same problem, yeah. theoretically. It would be <laughs> much more of a pain to get that through any kind of specification. But yeah, it could theoretically be done, solving that problem of more detailed description of USB devices by adding properties in, in this vein. Yes, there was. We were wrong then too. Yes. Yeah. Did you did you read optimism from me? Is there, is there a translation issue here? <laughs> no, absolutely. We had a clean new start with the device tree bindings, and we were planning to do the review. And yes, some things got reviewed, but a lot of things didn't. And there's a lot to review. And yeah, we've accepted some crap. On the other hand, we have got better. We are better at doing it now. And yes, in the ACPI world, they want to like to reinvent everything for themselves. We're really trying to push them not to. Um, so we want to be able to reuse existing bindings. Um, yes. Oh, God, yes. Well, that depends. It, this is not part of the official hardware spec. It is deliberately decoupled. It's handled under the umbrella of the UEFI forum, and the, the, they provide the mailing list and the, the storage space, but fundamentally, no. Um, there is a hope that potentially it would be acceptable to suggest that we migrate the whole thing there. I, I've tried to make it possible. There are a whole lot of political considerations with saying to people, oh, just abandon this and come over here and join EFI. Technically, I want it to be possible. I want it to be feasible to do that. And yes, I do not hold out much hope that we will magically get it better this time. Um, but if they want to start doing more review, that's never a bad thing. If we want to try and import existing bindings and tweak them, that's, if we have to, we, we can do that. So, yeah, I don't hold out much hope. I think we're going to have another fresh, clean start and end up in just the same situation, but there's no reason not to let them try. <laughs>
Um, but the really important thing, I think, is that we don't want to lose the knowledge that we already have on the device tree side. Yes, we made a lot of mistakes, but we've actually learned from those mistakes. And the bindings we tend to see these days are a lot better than the ones we used to. I do not want to see the free-for-all of crap start again with ACPI. I want to see that same tribal knowledge continue. And that's why I'm really keen that we do actually merge completely, or as much as possible, um, the two ways of describing bindings, because I re it's really important that they stay the same thing. I don't want to see an ACPI binding for a given device have a gratuitously different set of properties to the device tree binding for a given device, because then you do have to bind, again, have two different drivers or two different front ends to a core driver that binds to it differently and do different things and behave differently. And we really don't want to do that. So I think where a binding an existing device tree binding is tolerable and not egregiously broken, we should be using that in HPI rather than reinventing it because we can. Um, where it is egregiously broken, then yeah, maybe there is some scope for allowing the purists to say, okay, we'll describe this new, we'll come up with a new binding for this that is not broken, and then we'll have a driver that accepts both bindings. But if they're going to do that, then by hell make the new driver work via device tree as well, don't make it ACPI specific. And then maybe you can phase out the old one over time. If you really have to, I'm going to tell them they can do this and hope they never do. Because we could have done that with device tree bindings anyway, right? We go migrate from an old one to a new one and support both. We don't want to, we've done it very occasionally. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not very optimistic about it either. I, th I think we're doing okay. It does the job. We will move. Things are getting better. We are at better at providing the bindings. We have some scope by making it visible in this forum that we can push it towards the hardware vendors and the BIOS vendors and get it better supported and make things slightly better. I don't think it'll be a panacea, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Okay, thank you.